Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Wieger Opmeer. As in, this, me, this is me. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the Job Center uh, work an Orchestration Workflow Language, or Engine, uh, that we developed at Strato. Um, the Job Center is a pun on the, the uh, German the German name for the unemployment, unemployment office, that's called actually the job center in this spelling w with a small c there, but I think that's sort of how they call things in Germany. Okay, back to about me. Um, interesting. It's not following. I think that it should be following. Okay, this, this way down. Um, bit about me. I've been programming since the 80s on, started on 8-bit machines, home computers, uh, basic, all that, progressed onto assembly and then progressed onto almost any language out there, uh, worked with almost any Unix system out there at some point, uh, mostly Linux, mostly system administration, been, pro been programming along the site for years and I've been working for Strato as a real programmer now for the last four something years. Strato is a web hosting company that has been around for more than 20 years now. Um, that means that we have lots of legacy systems and lots of legacy code. Um, that's in. We're, we're running our shared web hosting platform on Solaris because end of the 90s that was a good idea and then moving things off is almost impossible as in we're seriously considering moving to Linux next year. So that might happen in a year or three. Um, we're still using Oracle as one of our main databases because that was a good idea in back in the 90s and moving the migrating databases is almost more impossible than moving uh, infrastructure and we're the other half of the company, hi Aitan, um, is actually using Sybase um, as in lots of history behind that why we're using separate, uh, separate databases in that company but oh well. Um, because it was started in the late 90s of course we do Perl because that was the language you used back then. Um, because we started in the 90s, um, most things were invented in-house because the custom, or the, the usual things weren't invented by them. So we do have uh, our own key value store, uh, sort of a, a Memcached or a Redis on steroids, as in it has its own inbuilt language, it has a replication system, all that, um, and it has never been open sourced because there's a, sh a don't share attitude at some point as a not invented here syndrome for a part as in it, it's a bit of a closed company that's slowly changing but okay it, it took a while to get something going. Um, Strato has been part of the Eins und Eins, or sorry the United Internet Group since last year um, which is actually the group that also our biggest competitor, Eins and Eins Internet, belongs to. So this is interesting. We're now looking at merging activities, at looking for synergy, at uh, converging systems. Okay, what what platform will be the shared web hosting platform in the long run? run things like that. Lots of things going on. But um, what is an orchestration workflow as in in the context of shared web hosting which is where the part of the Strata company where I work. Um, an example might be ordering WordPress and for that to actually work for the customer a lot of things need to happen as in we need to allocate a home directory somewhere. Um, we may as in we may need to determine the IP number based on the home directory we allocated. If we allocate it on some node that has a fixed IP number or something like that, then the IP number might be dependent on that. Then we have to configure a name server with, it, with the domain the customer has chosen pointing to that right IP number. That is actually needs to happen before we actually request the domain because some registries actually check 
if the DNS is set up correctly before they actually want to register a domain. So we need to do that before that. Then we actually need to register the domain, uh, depending on registries and how well things are currently working. That can take seconds up to days. Completely unpredictable how long that will take. Um, then we need to configure our web hosting platform itself, as in, in our case that is Apache and that would be a virtual host or a vhost. Um, that might be a specific ap Apache on a, storage on a specific storage machine. Uh, in the Sato world, we actually have a shared storage based on Netofilers, everything NFS mounted, so every web server can do everything. So all web servers need to be configured. And that's where our replicating key value stores come in. But even then, the right entry need, needs to show up at that point. Uh, you need to allocate a MySQL database. Create it, create some, create user, create things. Then you actually have to install WordPress as in unpack the PHP files, star, whatever, somewhere, and then call the configure PHP script, I think it's called WordPress configure, as in there's some PHP script that you have to call for WordPress that, that then actually will start doing things. I'm probably missing steps, but this is sort of what you need to do. And so this is an example of what orchestration is. Um, currently, most of that is done by lots of ad hoc state machines running from cron jobs, um, some state field in a database, as in depending on what is actually happening, that might be a different state field. Um, the business logic is spread over multiple scripts, multiple locations. So you actually have to know the system really, really, really well to actually debug things, where, where things go wrong. OK, things are getting stuck here. OK, that is that script that should be doing that. It's looking at that state. Difficult to, to do. Um, and because everything is on a cron schedule, things may, may take hours. So we actually have some horrible hacks in place with specific emails being mailed to specific addresses and then some proc mail rules trigger and that then call scripts and then suddenly things move along again. It works, but no, that's not how you want to do that. So wouldn't it be nice if we had some easy way to model all those state machines in some generic way, um, had some central place to store that and have some central way of introspect what the job is doing? Let's call an orchestration process a job, because that's why the, where the job center name comes from. And that's where the job center comes in. Um, we're a bit traditional, so we use a database as central storage. It's in no fancy whatevers, just a traditional SQL database. Um, original plan was to use Oracle. Eventually, we use Postgres because that was actually easier. And nowadays, we actually have to pay for our own Oracle licenses because we're no longer part of the Deutsche Telekom group. And now we know how much Oracle licenses cost, so we don't do want to do Oracle anymore. <laughs> um, database central storage. The state machine transition table or the program is stored there. The current state is in the program counter. Uh, every state transition is locked there. That is important. You want to know what the job did, how far it got, what, what, where, where it actually is, and you want to be able to, it needs to be crash proof. As in, if the database server if it crashes, if any worker crashes, whatever, it still needs to continue. Because these are long running jobs you want it to work on. Um, it also should be easy to see what the job state is. It, it helps that everything is just put into JSON objects. That means that at least it's reasonably easy to manipulate. Um, it also, because it's a in an, uh, SQL database, it's quite easy to manipulate a job, as in changing job state is uh, and just an update statement away if you know what you're doing. But at least when it's in alpha phase or beta, then it's easy to be able to meddle with things and do things with it. Um, the other thing, uh, most 
workflow engines out there are big, cumbersome, big code bases, uh, unwieldy configuration languages or some GUI interfaces or something like that to create your workflows. Um, not exactly our cup of tea. We want something lightweight, simple, something that we can easily maintain and hang around with. Um, th then it also means that, okay, if it's written in Perl, then it actually helps because it's easier for us to maintain than anything else. Open source would be nice, um, but that's mostly because then we don't have dependencies on some deep hidden code of our own that we cannot open source anymore. As in, it makes it make even easier, makes cooperation within the uh, company even easier, because w where we come from, we didn't even share code with the other half of the company, because they were the enemy. Uh, so. Have, having things a bit over open source actually means that you have clean code base with clean dependencies, and that, that actually helps in that regard. Okay. And the Perl license, artistic, art, artistic too. Yes, as, as in um, not CPAN, it's on GitHub. I will come to that later. Okay, um, some terminology to make it easier for me to explain things. A workflow is the program or state machine transition table. Actions are the steps in a workflow or the possible instructions. Um, actions can be done by something external, a worker can be internal, the ifs and whiles and whatever in your program. A workflow another workflow, as in workflows can call each other, which means that you can call workflows as, as if they were functions or subroutines or things like that. And other stored procedures in the database. Function we're not using, but we'll probably get to that. Um, actions have declared inputs and outputs, as in it's sort of a function with a declared set of input parameters and because we we want that um, multiple output parameters typed using JSON schemas. So something comes in, something comes out, and you can actually check if that, or at least basically check if that is somewhat sensible what happened. Um, and in, indeed workflows as subroutines. Um, a task is an action in workflow or an instruction in a program job is an instance of the workflow, as in the actual creation of the program, the, r the running program, so to speak. Um, a child job is a workflow that was called from another workflow, as in actually a subroutine call. Um, that's where we need a new workflow ID, or sorry, a new job ID, and new, st new state in the in the database because, yeah, it's actually a, a stack frame since in, in, in normal language sense. Um, and yes, a worker is an external entity capable of performing one of more actions. And that is actual, that's where the actual use of the job center comes in, as in everything internal is nice to have, but it's the external things, as in the creation of, an ho of the home directory, the registering domain, etc. That is all done by workers. That is where the actual use of the job center comes in. Okay, job state. Um, another way to describe the job center is a collection of job queues. A job queue would be waiting for some worker to come along to actually register domain, create that home directory, whatever. That would be one task. And within that task, there's actually, okay, it's ready, it's waiting for a worker to come along, it's working, the worker is actually doing something, it's done, the worker is actually done, has actually done what it was supposed to do, we hope, or it's through an error. And then there's the 
plotting phase, by lack of a better name. That is where the engine itself actually thinks, okay, what's next? What's the next task to do? What is the next instruction that we need to go to? So we have a current task, current instruction, the arguments that were the program or the workflow was started with, the variables as they're called, the actual current working set, they did the local variables of the workflow, and the task state. Um, to actually create those workflows, we made a little language called the Job Center language because we aren't good in, uh, in names, so it's we took the most simple name we could think of. Um, a custom workflow work modeling language. Why? Because we wanted to feel like, or somewhat feel like, a normal programming language. It isn't. You're working in a completely different environment, but you're working with in an environment with normal programmers who are used to reading programs. So you don't want to give them a graph with states or something like that, or you don't want to give them something YAML where they, you, they need to try to piece together what, what is actually happening. I think it needs to read, to read like a normal program. And the advantage of making it text-based, of making it like program, is that you actually can version control it and diff it like with the tools that you know and can read it that way because it actually looks like that. Um, then, of course, if you compile the Job Center language, you need the Job Center compiler, the JCC for that. A very imaginative name that. And that then is stored in the database in, in the in tables actually called tasks and actions and things like that. Um, to actually be able to execute that. Okay. The most simple job center language example. This is what you need to do to call a worker that can add a value to some other value as in the most simple calculator. Here we have the call add as in that is the actual okay call an external worker called add. These are the inputs as in, we want the counter input of the add worker to be set to the argument input, which means that the arguments of the workflow declared here are then copied into the arguments of the workflow worker. And we have a fixed value of three for the step. Then the worker goes to work and eventually produces the output that then ends up in something called the output variables and that will also uh, will again be called counter and we store that in a local variable called thing. Very imaginative again. So we have a workflow called call test because we're testing the calling mechanism that has an input argument called input of type number. It has an output or an output variable of type number and it has a, a workflow output map, as in that is actually the thing that computes how the job state actually will be converted into the output of the workflow. As in, in this case, it's simple. It's just the value of the local variable thing gets copied into output. Um, that might take some getting used to, but this is actually the way to um, have your interfaces clear and have a different, a clear s method or clear transformation about how the inputs and outputs of work of, of worker actually modify the job state, and how job state actually shows up in the output of a workflow. Um, it took us quite a while to come up with uh, with this way of doing things, but we think it actually works quite well. Of course, the job center languages has, has things like loops. As in, this does something like keep running until the counter reaches 10, probably. 
something like that. Um, of course, the, the nice th this is persistent, as in every step, so every iteration of the while loop is actually locked in the database, is a transaction. So if something crashes along the way, then the job will just continue when everything is back up. And that's the whole point of the thing. Of course, there are ifs or case statements. Um, I won't get into the detail, but this will actually tell you if you passed in, in a input string of foo, of bar or bus, or something else. Just a very simple explanation of how a case statement works. A picture, one of the few pictures in this presentation. Um, very simple picture, as in there's the job center itself, exist consisting of the Postgres database of a process called the Maestro and of a API. And then there's clients and workers. Um, the important to note thing to note here is that the Maestro and the API are separate, separate entities and they don't communicate with each other. Everything is actually done via the database. Because there's a low-level store procedure API that's actually doing everything. Um, as in there's cre create job, uh, get job status, and things like that. Simple store procedures for doing everything. And then the uh, PostgreSQL listen notify mechanism is used to actually move things along. As in that is a way for one client connection to tell another client connection, hey, something happened, you need to act. Um, and that is actually enough to get things going. I think that's where, where a client that creates a job can say to, to the engine, hey, a job has been created, you need to do something. A job has finished, you get the notifications for that, etc. The maestro process is actually the thing that does the, okay, what's next? What's the next step in the workflow? It um, so it keeps the time, uh, does retries of things. It uh, schedules some periodic job jobs, and it actually, um, based on the notification it gets, it calls some stored procedures. And what that actually amounts to is that it actually controls what the warrant job itself is doing. Um, Yes. And then there's the API layer, um, JSON RPC on a established connection. It's mostly a translation of the low level API, as in it's no longer Postgres, the Postgres protocol, but uh, JSON RPC things, but it's recognizable. It uses uh, TCP or TLS or whatever. Um, the advantage of JSON RPC is that multiple connect multiple requests can be in flight, ongoing at the same time. As in, it's completely asynchronous. As in, multiple calls can be happening at the same time, and it's actually two-way. As in, both both ends of the connection can send requests procedure calls or notifications or things like that. And that is actually what we need to make a long-lived thing like the job center work, because otherwise you end up with polling and, and, and or things like that, or, or very difficult things to actually get notifications across. And this is actually simple, as in you have a connection and you, you receive something on that connection, and that's it. Um, clients and workers have basically the same interface, as in um, there's a little authentication handshake going on when the connection is set up to actually authenticate who, who connected. And then a, wor a worker is a client that actually says, hey, I can do this. But at the same time, that worker can be a client and create jobs if it needs to. Um, and actually, a way of thinking about this it is, is that the API is just a proxy that calls the low-level store procedure API on behalf of the connected clients. Um, as in, it's a, it's a very thin layer. Um, and the only thing that the API adds on top of the low-level API is a 
concept of slots of, of, of uh, the amount of work a worker can do as in a worker can say hey I can do five things at a time if I'm already doing five jobs don't bother sending me more the API will keep track of that and not send it any more work but that's just a efficiency thing as in on the low level API the notifications will keep go going and the API will do the ignoring for you instead of that you have to do that in the workers then say I can't do that anymore Okay, so then we end up with, with a low-level view of a PostgreSQL server with multiple connections or multiple processes because that is how connections work in Postgres. The maestro having multiple connections, that is important, and clients and workers being connected. As in, a client of a worker could actually use the low-level API directly or they could use the JSON API. Both things are possible. To make this work, we have a little subclass of Mojo PG um, that actually allows you to have a connection pool of connections, say maximum 10 connections. And if all 10 connections is are busy, then your query will wait until the connection becomes available. As in, that's just this is the one thing that Mojo PG can't do. As in, it will open new connections if there's more work. And I don't want that, so I actually added a uh, queue query method and a query queue that actually allows the um, allows the amount of connections to be limited um, using Mojo PG or JetCenter PG. The, the Maestro can actually do multiple things at once, or it can call multiple query queries, have multiple queries ongoing at once because it has multiple connections. Um, and um, one thing is that the connections get closed after a limited amount of time, as in 5,000 queries or something like that. And that is actually because in Postgres 9.6 there is a memory leak if you use stored procedures in a specific way. We happen to do that, so we actually trigger the memory leak. Um, by reusing connections, it's actually ignorable. Low-level example. I think this is something you could type on your command line. Select star from create job. The call test workflow that we saw earlier with an input as JSON B type. And then what you get back is a job ID and something called a listen string, as in this is the pub sub channel you would need to listen on on, on the Postgres le level to actually see that your job has finished. Um, create job verifies that you are actually allowed to call that, um, verifies the uh, in input arguments against the JSON schemas, and then uh, insert a job record and sends a notification to the maestro, hey, there's a new job. What the maestro does then is actually say, hey, we need to find out what's next. A job has started. What's the next thing to do? Um, that is actually the do, do job task done. Because if you actually remember the state diagram from a couple of sheets, uh, sheets back, when something has been done, the worker is, has done something, the state of a job is done, and then the maestro comes in and say, hey, what's next? So a job task is in state done and we need to find out what's next. It returns the next thing to do in a tuple of workflow ID, task ID, job ID. Seen actually only the job ID would pr or the task ID and job ID would be enough, but this actually allows for some sanity checks in the code to actually see that see that we don't jump to the code from another program or something like that. As in of course that happened during development um, then things like that actually catch you. The next thing is again a something to do, um, a job task. Again, the maestro actually starts looking at the next thing to do and then sees, hey, but this is something that the worker needs to do. Job moves to stage ready. Um, a notification is sent to the worker or to anyone listening on the pub sub channel action one already. 
And then the API or a worker actually receives that notification and says, hey, I have something to do, apparently. Calls cat task, and that then returns the actual thing to do. And a uh, job cookie, which is actually something as in that is unique for this worker at this time doing this bit of work. And that means that if we actually have a retry or something like that of, 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 of a specific thing because the worker timed out and then after a day a worker reports back, hey, I actually did this, then we know that it's not no longer the output we're waiting for. And that's actually is important if you uh, have something like um, automatic retries and such. Um, worker goes do its calculations and then reports back, hey, I've done this, I've done my bit of work, as in that actual cookie, and the actual result of the task. Um, again, at this point, the output arguments are verified as in, okay, you actually are returning a number, but is it the number that I expect? If not, narrow is thrown. Again, the maestro needs to find out what's next, gets, gets the what next. Then we get another step, and this actually happens to be the end task. Um, and the end task is something internal. It's ac actually calculating the results of the workflow, as in the workflow output map that I showed earlier. Then, in the previous step, a notification was sent that the job was done, so the client can actually call get job status and get the results of the job. As in, the input was one two three, the output is one two six because we added three. Very complicated. Actually, um, all those inputs and output maps and all that is actually compiled into Perl, into the width of Perl. And then uh, there's the uh, one of the embedded store procedure languages in Postgres is Perl, and that's what we can use. So again, we have this workflow. Everything actually becomes a bit of Perl. So then our output becomes a hash output on hash O with the output thing as the local variable becomes, becomes the hash V, the inputs become the hash, in, uh, hash I, and things like that, as in reasonably simple. And then s something re reasonably simple like this actually makes it work, as in this is a function because Postgres calls them functions, stored procedure that accepts a lot of arguments written in the language PLPL, and then we have a bit of JSON and our own job center save module, which is using the standard Perl save module. We get everything as JSON strings, so we need to decode it into hashes, share them with our save box, and then actually execute a bit of code that we actually had. And then we actually have functioning input and output maps and, and uh, ifs and whiles and all that. Okay. What is on CPAN is the Job Center Client Mojo module, as in a, mojo, a Job Center Client written in Mojolicious. Um, and this is the minimum code that you need to actually write the ad worker that we had as an example earlier. So, and it's actually not the minimum amount of code because. I'm actually announcing an action and I'm doing it in asynchronous mode. Why? Because I just want to show you that you can do that. So in you connect a client to the job center as somebody, as in you, may, you have to tell who you are and some password or client certificate authentication or something like that. As in you have to tell how you want to authenticate. Then you actually announce an action in some way, and you have your worker function, and then you make your client actually work. 
have to wait for things. The do add is called with the job ID with the actual input variables of the uh, of the action and the callback. And in this case, we actually call the output of the callback that we need to send the output to after half a second. And this is just to show that you can make can make things asynchronous. Um, this is the minimum that you need to do to write a worker. This is the minimum you need to do to write clients. As in, again, job center client mojo new. Um, now we have an extra thing that says JSON, and that says that we don't pass in Perl hashes, but we pass in JSON strings. And that's just because we're lazy and want to copy in some JSON here. And uh, in the client, you can actually do a blocking call. You can, there's also non-blocking methods available, but if you're lazy, you can do it, just do it in the blocking way. Um, call the call test workflow with the input arguments, and then you'll get a job ID and the output arguments, or you'll get a null job ID and some error message, but let's forget about the errors here. Um, this is some actual production code from our system. Um, I won't go into the details of what it's actually doing, but there's actually some new things being introduced here. There's a role-based access control mechanism built in where you can say um, some connected clients or workers may do this or may call this. So there's actually roles. In a workflow declaration, it means that only the jobs spooler may roll, may call this workflow. And there's also the concept of locks, which means that you can actually prevent multiple workflows running at the same time. Multiple jobs for the same workflow at least running at the same time. So this is a workflow rock of prof v host event, the name of the workflow. This means that there will only be one uh, fee host event workflow be running at the same time. And we actually have a lock on the zone ID argument. Um, because we have to compute that, it doesn't go into this bit, but it actually needs to be in the actual code part of the workflow with the lock statement. Um, and there we lock the actual zone ID argument. And this means that even if there were, would be other workflows that would be doing something with zones, we would still block them executing. Another example here is, okay, um, if it's a bit too difficult to express in the normal job center language, then you can fall back to Perl blocks with the mm -hmm. double square brackets and, and then actually do things that way. Um, I'll cut back to that in a minute. Nothing more interesting here. Uh, more features of the job center. Um, there are actually some limits built in, as in you can actually limit a, a workflow to, or a job to only execute for 100 steps or something like that. Um, and that is just to catch runaway loops and things like that. Because if it's a, uh, if it's running in a database and it's designed to actually pick up when you kill the, when you rebooted machines and things like that, actually stopping the thing can be rather hard, as in then you actually have to delete job IDs from the database and all that. Um, there's also a depth limit, which means that you uh, can't call, as in a, uh, a workflow started from the create job from by, by, by the API. Um, may only call other workflows to a certain extent, to a certain depth, and that's just to stop recursion loops. As in, uh, one work uh, workflow A calls B, B calls C, calls A again, and if that keeps on, then you also have something that you don't uh, cannot easily stop. Um, we have error handling, a try and catch mechanism. As in, one if there's an error thrown by um, by a worker or something happens in a uh, one of the uh, Perl blocks division by zero or something like that, uh, an error happens um, and then you either need to handle that or the workflow will just stop in an error state and hey, that's it. 
um, bec because there's a strike catch mechanism, there's some way to get out of there. Um, it's also possible to start multiple child jobs at once, as in do multiple things in parallel at that point, um, and then wait for those child jobs to finish and continue with your thing. And this is something that you see in lots of workflow engines that is actually a useful thing to have and a bloody plain plane to implement and to get it right. Um, there's also an event mechanism, which means that uh, workflows can send messages to each other since some, some kind of uh, IPC mechanism. Um, it, it has been implemented. Uh, there are tests for it. We're not actually using it. So that's a bit of a pity about the amount of time we put into that. Um, I'll skip over this very quickly, as in this is something closely related to the job center. Uh, what the job center allows you to do, in some sense, is to do service composition, but it's very heavy because that's everything is a transaction, everything runs via the database, etc. This is a framework to do JSON RPC service composition in a read-only fashion, sort of, as in to actually uh, run things without a database. Okay, the job center is actually small. Um, I should have put some numbers from other workflow uh, engines in there, as in I actually looked at quite a, quite a lot of them, most of the open source ones. Most of them are large, lots of code, lots of complexity. Um, job center is actually reasonably small. Um, there's the actual work is being done in, in the SQL store procedures, and that's three and a half thousand lines of code. And there's 6,000 lines of Perl, uh, most of which is actually the, the compiler, because writing compilers is actually quite well, quite, quite hard work. Um, and it actually runs well on something like Raspberry Pi 3, as in your bottleneck is the IOs of, of, of the database, because it is a database, but memory-wise, etc., it actually runs, wise, uh, runs well. Of course, there are to-dos. Uh, the usual to-do of an open source project is documentation, because most programmers don't like writing documentation, and neither do I. Um, the compiler could be better. Um, not everything that we think should compile that looks logical uh, actually compiles, as in the, the, the grammar could be better. Um, it's actually very hard to get sensible error messages out of the package library that we're using to build the compiler. Maybe uh, that could be one reason to actually move to Perl 6 and implement it using the, all the goodies that we have in there. Um, I'm also not happy with the syntax of the language, as in, like you saw, it is, it's a bit Python-esque with, with significant white, white space and things like that intended to not look like Perl. That was the important thing, because you can actually have Perl blocks in there, and you actually want a visual distinction about what is Perl and what is the workflow language, so it should not like look like Perl, but maybe there are other things, other ways to actually do that. Um, and as, as in the, all the inputs and outputs and all that are being type-checked, but the actual job state variables are completely freeform. And that actually has already bitten us a couple of times to not have some checks on that. So that's a feature we would like to add to actually say, OK, yes, you have a local variable. It's all JSON, but you may only store a number into this field, because that would actually help us to catch some errors. OK. Um, the job center is on GitHub and GitLab as a as in, you can check it out from there, and then um, there's inst some installation instructions in there, and then um, go from there. The job center client client module is on CPAN. Um, that includes some example workers and clients, command line clients. And questions? Yes? Uh, you mentioned the type checking of the inputs and outputs variables. Yes. It's uh, okay. 
Um, the question was uh, how the uh, type checking of, of, of the inputs and outputs is being done. Um, it is uh, done in the database, yes, as in there's actually a JSON schema verifier built into in, in, in uh, the uh, Postgres stored procedure language, some open source project that I created for you, borrowed, and that actually does the checking. Uh, because uh, it's very uh, difficult to store the state, the actual running state of Lua in the database. And I actually, I, I actually want everything be able to crash, and the state should be on disk. It's, and it's you, as far as I know, you cannot do that with Lua. And I've actually built Lua integrations with various languages. So uh, I've seen the internals of Lua quite extensively, and I'm not aware of any way of doing that. Yes. Um, the question. <laughs> repeat the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, the question is uh, why being asynchronous is an advantage. Um, some workers could actually be doing multiple things at once, as in if, if the worker needs to uh, talk to a domain registry or something like that, it might have multiple connections open to uh, the registry or to different registries. So it might actually be able to do, do multiple jobs at once. It might be able to register dot .com and dot .de domain at once. So that's why the having it asynchronous actually means that, okay, a worker can do multiple things at once. Does that answer your question? Um, the question is what tools would you use for queue management? Um, the current answer is none, as in the oldest job gets done first. Um, that's mostly because we haven't needed anything else yet. Um, I actually try to only implement what we currently need and not to introduce extra complexity, but it, it should be reasonably easy to add a priority field somewhere and, and base decisions on that, but haven't done that yet. Sorry, could you repeat that? Okay, uh, the question is how much volume of work we're putting through it. Um, at the moment, something like 50, 60,000 jobs a day. Um, but that is actually on some rather beefy hardware because being a shared web hosting company means that we usually have some spare hardware lying around that is seen and Old hardware is something with 32 cores and uh, half a terabyte of memory and things like that. That is hardware we throw away. So we use that for database servers. So that works for <laughs> um, that kind of jobs. Uh, but yeah, ac actually, um, uh, on that kind of hardware, uh, 60,000 jobs a day. Uh, does not make the load average r <coughs> rise above zero dot no zero dot zero one that one. No. No. As 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 in the bottlenecks that we have reached is actually on um uh Communication delays, as in Strato has their data centers in both uh, Karlsruhe and Berlin, and some one of the things that you actually ran into is that it takes 20 milliseconds to get a packet from one data center to the other, and that was actually the, the limiting factor. Okay, more questions. Yes. Um, as, as, as in currently, we're running uh, the, the, uh, the Maestro and the API and the master database on one server because of the uh, 
um, currently, I would actually suggest that um, uh, that is the best way to run it. Uh, but theoretically, it's possible to have multiple uh, APIs running, to have multiple Maestro processors running. Although that will not buy you much, um, but you will you will have that one database as the bottleneck. So. Mm, don't expect it to do thousands of jobs per second because you will just run into a transaction limit. Um, lots of trying. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, there's a, s a simple test suit that actually um, uh, tests the, uh, the incomes and output inputs and outputs. Uh, no, the test suit is not complete. F very much so, as in usual. <laughs> um, so there's probably bugs in there, um, but I'm yeah pretty sure it works reasonably well. Okay, the question. <laughs> remembering to repeat, uh, uh, would you recommend writing DSLs for other uh, projects? Um, only if you can keep your DSL simple. As, as in, I'm, I, um, our first version of the Job Center languages was just some wrappers, <laughs> some things about Perl, block, Perl code blocks, and then we at point one point said, okay, we want to get rid of those ugly bits of code to make it all look like one language. And that's where the can of worms opened up and you actually delve into the complete complexity of trying to parse expressions and things like that. And that's, no, don't try to do that. As, as in, that is a lot, that, that's a lot of work. Not time-wise, but uh, actually, but uh, code-wise, yes, it is actually quite, quite a bit of, of the code and of the complexity is, is in that, that bit. Most of the time just went into uh, how do you actually implement a thing like this and how should it work? As, as in, uh, it looks l well designed and t well thought out, but that's mostly because we threw away lots of attempts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, more questions? Well then, we are past the time, so thank you for being here.